Welcome back students. This is the last video for the cell review um, section of our unit. Uh, the slide just kind of shows you in general, you know, we talked about the cell membrane and how it has different kinds of um, things embedded in, in it, making it a, a uh, mosaic. Um, so these things that are in the cell membrane can determine what moves through. And in general, you can have substances that can move through on their own, um, things like nonpolar molecules like fatty acids, but vitamins, steroids, um, again, because that middle portion of the plasma membrane is made up of the tails, which are nonpolar, so nonpolar things can go through nonpolar environment, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. Then substances that cannot move through are things like different ions and polar molecules. The polar part of the membrane is on the outside and the inside, so if it's polar, it can't go through the fatty portion of it. So these include polysaccharides, amino acids, glucose, and nucleic acids. But they, these things need to go through, so there's gotta be some way that they can get through, and that's what we're gonna be talking about in this 3.3 uh, module of the chapter three review. Here is the um, first, I believe it's the first part of the first page that you have of your notes. So make sure you have this in your um, data log. <clears throat> so we're 3.3 and what are types of movement across the cell membrane? Um, you can basically have several different general ways of movement. So they can go directly, things can go directly through what's called diffusion. It's a movement of solute which those are the ions or molecules that are moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration of that same solute. So when you're looking at concentrations of things, just in general, moving from high to a low is a natural state. Uh, if you, and I'll show you this on the debrief day, but if you have a beaker of water and you add some uh, food coloring in there, you drop, put a drop in there, it's that solute, the molecules of, of dye are very concentrated. There's a high concentration of them in the dot, but as you sit and watch it naturally, it's gonna spread throughout the water until it's equally distributed, going to equilibrium. So in the beaker, there's a low concentration of the dye solute, and so it's gonna move from that high point of the dot that you just dropped in to the low part of the beaker until you reach equilibrium. Examples of these things would be oxygen and carbon dioxide gas. Other ways things can move through are through these membrane channels, and these are proteins that are embedded in the membrane. And you labeled these on your plasma membrane diagram that you have. Uh, and so these can extend from one side of the cell mem membrane to the other, and the size, shape, and charge of these channels or of what the solute is will determine what goes through. So these membrane channels can be very specific for things. So a, a sodium channel is gonna let sodium through. Think of it kind of like a tunnel going underground. You can go through the tunnel um, to get to the other side. There's also carrier molecules that can bind to the solutes, transport them across the membrane, then drop them off. Glucose gets into your cells this way by using a carrier molecule. That would be insulin. And finally, vesicles can transport a variety of materials, and those actually fuse with the cell membrane and just dump the contents either in or outside the cell. So these are general ways that things can move. We're going to look specifically at several of them in the rest of this video. So if it's a passive process, that means no extra energy is required. I mentioned to you that diffusion is a very natural Natural type, excuse me, natural type of movement, you don't have to do anything. The cell doesn't have to do anything. It's just going to automatically do it. So here is diffusion again, movement 
movement of molecules or solutes down a concentration gradient from across from areas of high to low concentration. So a concentration gradient is just a, a um, it is an area that has differing concentrations. So you go from high to low, low to high, but if there's a difference in the area, then it's called a concentration gradient. Now, some substances will use channels to travel can use channels to travel through the membrane. Uh, one type of channel is a leak channel, and it's just it's like a, a door that stays open. It constantly allows the ions to pass through. Gated channels, however, will limit the movement of ions across a membrane by opening and closing, just like a gate would um, through a fence into a yard. <clears throat> Think about, let's say you have a leak in. Uh, your Ziploc baggie, unless you fix it, it's just con things, if you put water in it, it's constantly be going to be um, leaking through. So that's why, why it's called a leak channel. I'm having problems talking today, excuse me. So that's diffusion. Now, facilitated diffusion is still movement from a high to a low concentration. That's the nature of diffusion. But if it has a helper or a carrier molecule with it, allowing it to do that, then it's facilitated diffusion. So the molecules are moved still from a high to a low concentration, but it does need something to help it move across. It still requires no ATP, which is the energy molecule. The example here I talked about was glucose. Okay, here is the rest of um, your first page and then also into your second page of notes. Osmosis is a third type of movement, uh, sorry, passive movement, here we go, and it's still, again, passive. It's high to low, no energy, but is specifically talking about the diffusion of water. So water has its own special type of uh, name of a, a process. Now, a couple of things we need to look at to understand how this works is osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure. Um, so if you've ever stood in a moving river or stream, you have felt the pressure of the water pushing you. And so water definitely has pressure associated with it. And that's why you can get into trouble with floods because that water, you know, if, if a road is flooding and you think you're driving and you're like, I'll go ahead and cross it. You know, they say turn around and don't drown because once you get into that water, sometimes the pressure is high enough and hard enough it can actually move your vehicle into the river or whatever parts flooding. So the force required to prevent that movement of water, that's what osmotic pressure is. And we're talking about specifically about a selectively permeable membrane. So the force required to prevent the movement of water. The hydrostatic pressure is the pressure exerted by the liquid um, as a result of the potential energy that it has. So water is going to want to push against something, but if you're doing against it, that's osmotic pressure. So when you're putting a cell into a, a different, whatever solution it is in, um, it can actually change. It can either get bigger, it can shrink, or it can just stay the same, depending on the concentration gradient between the solution and the cell's cytoplasm. So think about a cell, remember it has that jelly-like fluid, the cytoplasm in it, and you're going to put it into a beaker of solution. And however many solutes are in the beaker, beaker water compared to what's in the cytoplasm, that's going to cause um, the water levels to change and to move because of these two different kinds of pressures we talked about here. If you're putting it into a solution, let's say in your beaker, that has very low solute compared to the cell, but it has more water compared to that, then the cell is going to burst because remember that water moves from a high to a low concentration. So if you have more water molecules in the beaker of water than you do in the cell, then the water is going to go into the cell and it's going to do it till it reaches equilibrium. Depending on how much water is there, if there's a high enough amount, it could cause it to burst 
because it keeps moving. It's like putting water into a water into a balloon that you're trying to make a water balloon. If you keep going, if you don't stop the water, it eventually will burst. That's a hypotonic solution. Hypo means below, and tonic refers to the solutes. Remember that the liquid part that is the solvent of a solution, the particles are the solutes. So I'm talking about a sugar solution or a salt solution. Uh, you know, you're going to be learning about um, IV solutions when you're here before you become a, a certified nursing assistant. And so that whatever they put in the IV solution, it could be glucose, it could be salt um, to maintain a person's volume of liquid in their body. So hypo means it's below. Low solute, so there's high water. Hypertonic is the opposite. The hyper solutes, there's high numbers of solutes, so that means there's going to be a low amount of water. If it's lower than the cell that you put in there, then the water is going to leave the cell because, again, it's going from high to low concentration. And those cells can actually shrink. That's what crenation is. The water moves from inside the cell to outside and it'll get smaller and if it depending on how much water's in the cell and how little is in your solution it may actually shrink till it shrivels up isotonic solution means that you have the same number of solutes in your cell as you do in the water of the beaker so there's not going to be a movement of water across the membrane because it's the same those are all your po passive processes and we're going to look a little bit more at osmosis because uh, there's some specific things we're going to be talking about during the year with that. And we'll talk more about that on debrief day. Active processes then are those that do require energy. So they need ATP. It's going against the grain. Um, let's say you're at a pep rally at your school and everybody's in there, the pep rally's over, and you're all funneling through that one door. You know, it's a slow thing, you're moving slowly, but everybody's going the same direction. Well, let's say you've made it through the door, but then you realize you forgot your purse in the stand, so you're going to have to go back through all those people to get to, to get to your purse. And so, is it easy to do? No, it's not very easy. You're going to have to kind of push and fight and expend a little energy to go, oh, excuse me, I need to get back in. And that's what active processes are. They require additional energy because they're going against the grain. So active transport is your main process we'll be talking about in here. That's where molecules go up a concentration gradient, not down like with passive, from low to high concentration. <clears throat> Um, examples of things that do this would be sodium and potassium ions. Something very similar to active transport is called secondary active transport, and that's when you have energy from secondary active transport of one, one substance that comes from the concentration gradient of another. Endocytosis is a specific movement by cells. By vesicles in the cells and endo means you're it's you're taking you're taking something into your cell even if the concentration may be going against it you're doing this process that takes it into the cell there's two different kinds depending on what you're taking in if you're taking in a solid particle that's called phagocytosis this phag that root word means to eat and then cyto remember cells eat that means cells so phagocytosis is cells eating Kind of like a, if you picture an amoeba, you've talked about those in biology before. When they come up to a food source, they surround it and engulf that food. That's what phagocytosis is. If you're taking in liquid particles, that's called pinocytosis. Pino means to drink, and cyte, again, is cell. Both of those are taking something in. If you're trying to get something out of the cell that's requiring extra energy to get rid of, even though it naturally want to stay there. That's called exocytosis. Exo means to the outside. Cyto means cell, so movement out of the cells. And these involve vesicles as well. We looked at what vesicles were in the previous videos. So those are the notes for your um, section 3.3. This shows you another uh, picture 
of the membrane and the different things we talked about. So if it's lipid soluble, that means it can go directly through this membrane. You don't have to have any extra help. It naturally goes through because these tails of the phospholipids are made of lipids. The non-lipid molecules do not, can't go through. That's what this arrow means. It tries to go through, but it can't because it cannot go through this membrane, the fats of the membranes. These are some specific non-lipid solu soluble molecules or ions that need the help of a membrane channel to get through. So here's your membrane channel that was going completely through the membrane. And it's like, again, like I said, like a tunnel where it can just, it's like a big old tunnel that it can just go through. It's not lipid soluble, so it couldn't do this action here. It has to have help with this membrane channel. There's a picture of your leak and gated channels. So the, again, the leak channels are ones that are always open. Okay, there's no gate or anything. They can go in or out. And then the gated channels have a gate. It just looks like a gate. When it's closed, it can't, it can't go out. But when it's open, they can move in and out. This is showing movement into the cell. Facilitated diffusion. So you're going from high to low concentration. You have like four molecules on the outside, nothing on the inside. So it's going to go from high to low, but it uses has to use this carrier molecule. It facilitates. If you're a facilitator, you're helping. So it binds to that and then dumps it into the cell here. So this is showing it dumping it into the cell. Here's that difference between hydrostatic and osmotic pressure that I was talking about. So the osmotic pressure, that's where the movement, um, you know, is the force against the water pushing it out. And here are the three different solutions that I mentioned, hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic. Hypo, low solutes, so water is going to go in, and this shows you that, where it can burst to the degree that it can burst. Uh, this is a red blood cell in an isotonic solution. Nothing's happening to it because there's equal amounts of solutes but are in and outside the cell. And then here's the hypertonic solution where there's less water outside, so water is going to leave the cell and make it shrivel up. We're going to do an activity in class with potatoes, sections of a potato, where you can definitely see um, the difference um, as to what happens when you put those pieces of potatoes in the different tonicity solutions. Here's active transport, the sodium potassium pump. We'll talk about that when we discuss the nervous system later. But again, this is showing you it's going against the concentration gradient. Um, it's taking it from low to a high concentration. So even though the sodium levels are low on the outside, it's still going to be pumping more in. Secondary active transport that involves this active transport pump, but you also have to use the carrier molecule with it. So that's why it's called secondary. It uses, the cell uses the carrier molecule to get it in and then it has to use the tractive transport mechanism to get it out. So it's kind of like a combo, combo type of um, movement. And here is endo um, and exocytosis. Here's the plasma membrane. So exocytosis, you have these molecules on the inside of the cell in the vesicle. It fuses with the membrane, and as it gets to the exterior or the outer part of the membrane, it just opens up, and that releases the contents of it. This is gross, but it's almost like popping a pimple. <laughs> so you'll never forget that again. Endocytosis is going in. So you have this uh, particle food, uh, you know, a solid particle on the outside of the cell that needs to get in. So it fuses with the cell membrane, forming a vesicle that can then go into the inside of the cell and deposit it. This is talking about specifically phagocytosis with the solid particle. Pinocytosis is the liquid material that's coming in. So now it's your turn. So you will get, you have two things you're going to be doing. The first on the left of the first page of 3.3 is this page here. 